All right, welcome back to our Chapter 7 video lecture series. We are looking at the uh, chi-squared goodness of fit test. In the last video, we were going over the question, do SRJC students prefer the fantasy series Game of Thrones, Lord of the Rings, and Harry Potter equally? As a class, you guys picked 5 for Game of Thrones, 13 Harry Potter, or sorry, 5 for Game of Thrones, 13 Lord of the Rings, and 8 for Harry Potter. So noted we have three categories and a sample size of 26. And we went through, if we're going to fit, we're going to assume some distribution uh, fits some observed values. So in this case, we're assuming they're all equal. The three different fantasy series are equal at one third each. And we use that 26 um, times a third to get the expected counts. And this then, this is how we got our test statistic. So I want to go through right now and uh, actually go through the computations. And how do we get our test statistic? So we got the observed value and the expected value for Game of Thrones. Observed value is 5, expected value is 8.62. Now we're going to calculate like this. The observed count is 5 minus the expected, 8.67. We're going to square that value and then divide by 8.67. And I'm going to throw this in my calculator. 5 minus 8.67 squared divided by 8.67. I got this to be about 1.554. Just for spacing, I'm going to scoot this over a little bit. For the next category, Lord of the Rings, if we want to find the observed 13 minus the expected, 8.67, square that value, and then divide that whole thing by 8.67. I'm going to throw this in my calculator now. And that ends up being 2.163. And then for the last category, Harry Potter. Notice the observed and the expected are pretty close. So we're not going to get too very different of an of, um, We're going to get a pretty small uh, chi squared contribution. 0.67. So I'm going to take. 8 minus 8.67, square that value, and then divide it by 8.67. And this is about 0 0.052. All right, so this row right here, these are called the this is called our the chi squared. contribution. So we have our observed counts and expected counts. The chi-squared contribution is the difference between these two squared, but then we want to take that relative to the expected count. So this is a quick numerical measure to see well how far apart are the observed from the expected. Harry Potter was pretty close. Game of Thrones was a little bit more off. Should have been 8.67, but it was 5. And Lord of the Rings was the most off, 13. But it should have been closer to 8.67. So that had the largest chi-squared contribution. So then finally to get the test, the chi-squared test statistic. No, that's a lot of verbiage. I'm going to go down here. My test statistic is just going to be the sum of all those, 1.554 plus... 2.163 plus 0 0.052. I got that to be about 3.771. That is my chi squared test statistic. All right, I want to note right here my degrees of freedom. 
is defined to be k, sorry, k minus 1. So in this case, there's three categories minus 1. I have two degrees of freedom. Excuse me. So the p value is going to equal, and here I'm going to go to stat key. I got the chi squared of 3.771. Over to stat key, the theoretical distributions. We're going to go over to the chi squared, third one from the left. <clears throat> Enter new degrees of freedom. We have two degrees of freedom in this case. For chi squared, which they only give you right tail, because for this class we're only going to look at right tail. And this bottom entry, I want to change this, my test statistic, to 3.771. Here we get a, chi, a p value of 0 0.152. 0 0.152. So using a 5% significance level, we would fail to reject the null hypothesis. So I'll put it our class data does not provide evidence that SRJC students do not prefer the three fantasy series equally. All right, I kind of go through the same example each semester. One time, uh, the observed versus expected counts were far off enough to reject. And they are far, a little bit far off for Game of Thrones, Lord of the Rings, but Harry Potter's pretty close. And what this is saying is, if it's true that if we took, if we sampled all SRJC students and asked them which of those three series they prefer, and they all, uh, these were all equal, about the same value, then we'd have about a 15% chance of having this class data that we did. So that's kind of low, but definitely not low enough with a 5% threshold to reject the null hypothesis. All right, so here's one example going through um, a chi-squared goodness of fit test. And for goodness of fit, uh, for small data sets like this one, I do expect you to be able to calculate your chi-squared contributions uh, you know, by hand and come up with a chi-squared test statistic. Um, but there is, I did want to show you on GeoGebra, the GeoGebra software. If we click on probability, and then statistics, sorry, a bit. and then statistics over here, and the drop down menu, there is a goodness of fit option right here. Goodness of fit. And you could type in, let's see what we have. Game of Thrones, observed count was 5, expected count was 8.67, Lord of the Rings, observed count we had 13, equally be 8.67, and Harry Potter we had 8 and 8.67, and down here it gives you your chi-squared, and this is rounded a little bit differently because they, they use different different amount of decimals for the chi-squared, but basically the same thing, 3.77, two degrees of freedom, and it gives you the p-value as well. The one drawback for this is it does not give your chi-squared contribution. And I could ask for that chi-squared contribution, so make sure to practice this formula with the practice homework, write this under note sheet for the test, and make sure you're comfortable with this process. All right, so I want to go through that one example in detail for chi-squared goodness of fit. As another example we could do is that Rhesus claims that the color distribution for Rhesus pieces is 50% orange, 25% yellow, and 25% brown. How can we test this claim? Well, we're going to next class. We can get multiple samples of Rhesus pieces, count how many of each color is in the sample, and then conduct a, a goodness of fit hypothesis test. So I'm going to bring in a bunch of uh, Reese's pieces in the next class, and we'll go through and um, we'll do actually a whole bunch of hypothesis tests to see if Reese's pieces claim is correct.
Okay, so I want to talk about um, our second hypothesis test in chapter seven called the test for association. So in this section, we consider two-way tables, also called contingency tables, which include frequency counts for categorical data, a range and table, and we have to have at least two rows and two columns. And these do not count labels, two rows and two columns of data. So I want to think about one variable is used to categorize, to categorize the rows, and the other variable is used for columns in a contingency or two-way table. And we're going to go through a method for testing the claim that the row and column variables are associated or whether they're independent from one another. All right, so the chi-squared test of association. This is also called a test of independence. So if you look at another stats book or other um, research papers or whatnot, you might see a test for independence. Our book calls it association. But it tests the null hypothesis that in a contingency table, the row and column variables are independent. So you assume no association. Notice the notation here, similar to the goodness of fit. O is the observed frequencies. E is the expected frequencies. And you're assuming the row and column variables are independent. R represents the number of rows in a contingency table, not including labels. And C is the number of columns not including the labels. So these are the number of categories, but in each variable. And n is the grand total of all the data points. The requirements are similar to goodness of fit. We need to have a random sample. The sample data should be able to be represented as a frequency count in a two-way or contingency table. And for every cell in the contingency table, the expected frequency has to be at least five. And that reminded me, I forgot in the last example, right here, we did have that. Expected counts were all at least five. So that's what that means. All of these values, expected counts, need to be five or greater. The same applies here for the test for association. And the null and alternative hypothesis um, are always going to have the same setup. The, the null is that the row and column variables are not associated. On the previous slide, I said they are independent. That is the same thing. If two things are independent, they're not associated. And the alternative is the row and column variables are associated. Actually, before we go on for that, I just want to make a quick note. If we do reject the null, we can't say anything about causality. We can't say one variable causes the other one to change. We just say there's some association. Getting to that causality is a lot more difficult. All right, degrees of freedom formula is R minus 1 times C minus 1. C is the number of rows, and R is the number of columns, again, without labels. And just like the goodness of fit, these tests for independence or tests for association are always right-tailed. Oh, okay, I did have it slide. It's good. The procedure, this procedure cannot be used to establish a direct cause and effect between the variables in question. You can't do that from just one sample and one hypothesis test, generally. Dependence only means that there is some relationship or association between the variables. Figuring out what exactly and how that exact association is, whether you know A implies B or B implies A, or there's some symbiotic relationship, is a lot more difficult. All right, so another way you might see hypothesis test for association is set up like this. You assume the row and column variables are independent. Again, that's the same as no association. And the alternative is the row and column variables are dependent, which is the same as that there is some association. All right, so the test statistic is calculated the same exact way, the difference between the observed and expected count squared over expected counts. And the expected counts can be computed by um, evaluating the following for each cell in the contingency table row total times column total over grand total. Where does this formula come from? I'm going to go over that in our next class period. It kind of comes from this, but I want to explain where this comes from the next time we meet for class. Okay, in the next video, I'm going to go over this example.